the government license issued to an inventor or company to commercially protect or exploit an innovation or design, are wide-ranging and can be as small as a new way of doing something, up to a total rethink of how an existing thing might work. Julian Viaschorek, a Polish national living in France, falls into this latter category. Between 1986 and 2000, he submitted a set of design patents for a completely new tank. That is, a tank not just new in design, but new in philosophy as well. A tank with formidable armament, impenetrable armor, and a level of mobility to surpass any contemporary vehicle in NATO or beyond. Fiasorek's designs are from a skilled engineer looking at some of the fundamental problems associated with tank design and finding a way to work around them to produce a newer, bigger, and better tank. A tank with formidable armament, impenetrable armor, and a level of mobility to surpass any contemporary vehicle in NATO or beyond. His designs were not built, but they not only provide an insight into some alternative solutions to the technical limits of current tanks, but perhaps also more widely into the design of modern tanks and the turn of the Cold War, where masked tank combat became less and less likely. At a time when nations were reducing tank numbers or seeking lighter and more flexible vehicles, Vyashorek doubled down with a design nearly twice the weight and larger than any other, a true super heavy tank for the 21st century. Hello and welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host, Wood, and today I'll be covering the Vyashorek Anjou Blondie du Combat and Anjou Blondie du Combat Lour main battle tanks. If you like our videos and want to support us, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All the funds will be used to improve future Tank Encyclopedia content. Any help is greatly appreciated. Julian Vyashorek left a long catalog of engineering and design work in the patent office yet it is somewhat hard to trace from just those records. What can be discerned from them, however, is that Vyashorek was a Polish citizen who was living in France. He was clearly a professional engineer rather than the amateur armchair type of inventor. This is evidenced by the fact that he had taken part in one of the submission ideas for the road rail link between the United Kingdom and France, which became the Channel Tunnel. His idea was for a large suspension bridge and a barrage type crossing rather than a tunnel. Over the years, Vyashorek had turned his mind to all sorts of civil engineering and military projects. Of particular note, however, are three designs from him relating to armored vehicles. The first was filed in October 1986 titled, Independent Armored Modules for the Driver, Observer, and Gunner for an Automatic Loading Armored Fighting Vehicle. The second of these was filed as, Additional Armor Units with Rocket Launching Systems for an Armored Fighting Vehicle with Automatic Loading in March of 1987. And the third design was filed in August 1996 titled Method for Constructing, Repair, Maintenance, and Transport of Heavy Armored Fighting Vehicles Consisting of Several Modules. The second patent design was, for 1987, certainly ahead of its time in several areas, not least of which was an overall shape of a slab-sided tank, which stands apart from its cast steel and rounded predecessors from the 1970s or before. In fact, Vyashorek alludes to the inspiration of this new shape as coming from the public unveiling of the new French tank, the replacement for the AMX-30 known as the Leclerc at Satori, France in 1987. This new vehicle was what Vyashorek called an Anjou Blondie du Combat, or an armored combat vehicle. Vyashorek has preceded this unveiling with his own submission in October 1986, which was eventually issued as French patent FR-2605095, which was about the separation and individual protection of crew positions within a new auto-loaded main battle tank. The 1986 vehicle is only mentioned as being of similar size to modern main battle tanks like the M1 Abrams and Leopard 2. This probably means a length, without a gun, of about 10 meters, a width of 3.5, and, and a height of about 2.5. In the French patent from 1986, Vyashorek is clear that his goal was the creation of a modern tank which used an autoloading system to reduce the crew from 4 men to just 3. The three crew members would sit in separate armored pods placed in the turret and hull. The driver would stay in the hull whilst the gunner and commander would stay in the turret and their pods. Vyashorek also avoided the common design choice of moving all crew members into the hull for extra protection, preferring to maintain the observation advantage given by an elevated position. The tank commander would be located on the right whilst the gunner would be on the left in the turret. Despite being separated by their individual armored pods and being physically apart within the vehicle, the 1986 patent makes it very clear that they would be in communication with each other continuously using both video and the internal radio communications. The driver seems to have had access to three vision ports mounted on a rounded hatch. It is unclear how this hatch opened and if it would have interfered with the gun or the turret. The commander had access to eight vision ports on his cupola, 
while the gunner on the left had access to four vision ports and a telescopic sight. The great advantage of pods, except for the obvious addition of protection, was the supplementary protection of the crew from internal fires, explosions, fire extinguisher gases, and NBC threats. It was far easier to insulate just the small pods than the entirety of a fighting compartment. Like other heavy tanks, Via Shorek's design was planned to be well protected by means of a modern, multi-layered arrangement, presumably composite armor. The sides of the vehicle would be covered by very thick side skirts that were connected to the hull over the tracks and to the extended magazine in between the tracks. Should anything manage to penetrate the outer armor of the tank, or should a fire ensue inside, the crew were protected by their individual pods. Those pods were to be made of a composite material involving steel or another lighter alloy and Kevlar, this provided protection from shrapnel and fire alike. Very little is mentioned in the 1986 patent about the automotive components of the engine. The engine and the transmission are at the rear of the vehicle, under a raised engine deck cupola with two large fans for cooling. The air intakes are on the side of the vehicle, and it should be noted that the space allocated for the engine and transmission is very small. However, Viashorek mentions not only that these components can be moved to the front, but also that it should be possible to mount two engines and two transmissions, one at the front and one at the rear. The tank was to be supported on seven sets of double road wheels on each side. Each pair of wheels was fixed on a common trailing arm. Unusually too for the design was that the road wheel pairs were not all the same size. The leading two and the rearmost two pairs of wheel were of a larger diameter than the three central pairs, as this decrease in height allowed for the hull width extensions inside the track run. Making them slightly smaller allowed them to still deflect upwards by up to 200 millimeters without striking the whole side extensions. The drive sprocket was to be at the rear, the idler at the front, and just two return rollers were used, one on each side of the bulging ammunition compartment. Although the drawings appear to show torsion bars across the width of the bottom of the hull, this is misleading. Via Shorek determined that the torsion bars would not provide suitable suspension across the potential temperature ranges in which the tank was going to operate at, namely negative 55 Celsius to positive 60 Celsius, and therefore the design would use hydropneumatic suspension instead. This system would allow for both manual and automatic adjustment of height, meaning Via Shorek's design would be able to keep good ground clearance for off-road running and then lower itself in a fighting location to the extent of the hull floor being in contact with the ground. The tank would engage an enemy with its primary armament, an auto-loaded 120mm gun. Ammunition for the main gun was to be either kinetic energy, basically armor-piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo, or high-explosive anti-tank, which Via Shorek called a multi-purpose round. With an assumed overall weight of 55 tons, 40 rounds of these shells at 20 kilograms each would be just 800 kilograms. Via Shorek saw that as long as they could be made to fit in the space of a tank, then increasing ammunition storage could increase the firepower of the tank without much of an increase in mass. The plan, therefore, was to adopt an 80-round loadout for a total of just 1.6 tons. The autoloader speed was estimated to be able to provide 10 to 12 rounds per minute, but far more unusual than the prospective high rate of fire was the layout of the loading system and how Via Shorek amended the hull shape to accommodate it. His solution was to place the ammunition in the bottom of the hull, in two large circular carousels. No secondary armament is mentioned in the patent. Via Shorek proposed the use of a semi-trailer to be towed by the EBC and then used to reload the two magazines. The two magazines would be reloaded through the belly of the tank through two intermediary magazines. Via Shorek was clear even in the first filing in October 1986 that the goal was an auto-loaded tank to both increase firepower and also to reduce the number of crew from four to three. Storing additional rounds and pods in the back was not going to be a viable solution, and was just one of several ideas floated around to bolster the available stock of ammunition. If the ammunition stowage for the autoloader was to going to be in the back of the turret, then it was going to be limited by the volume available, although it had the advantage of accommodating the length of a unitary shell well. Nonetheless, not more than 20 or 30 rounds could be carried effectively in this manner, and if there was a move to an even larger caliber gun of, say, 140 millimeters, then even fewer could be carried due to the width of the shells and the dimension of the bustle rack. The solution was to put the rounds in the hole, like the Soviets had done with the carousel-type loader on the T-72. However, herein lies an additional problem, hole width. Unitary 120 millimeter caliber shells would not be able to fit in a normal type of hull with a carousel autoloader, so even considering 140 millimeter rounds in such a way was completely out of the question. The greatest single limiting factor in tank design is not weight, nor speed, or even cost, but width. 
width because most long tank movements are by rail, and this means the rail gauge limits how wide of a load can be transported without fouling on a neighboring track, platforms, or bridges. This is generally around 3 to 3.5 meters in real terms for maximum width and excluding any side armor modules added later. The length of a tank shell, such as a 120mm NATO discarding sable round, is 1 meter. Arranging such full-size shells on a carousel would mean placing them facing each other, doubling that in terms of required width. Even before considering the mechanism itself to rotate and move the shells, a full 2 meters of the internal width of the tank is taken up by ammo. On a conventional hull, where the sides of the hull do not project through over the tracks, and where the overall width is 3 meters, it has to be factored in that the tracks on each side deduct from this maximum width. A track of even 60 centimeters width on each side, a little clearance between the hull side and the track and the thickness of the hulls, means a central internal space of just 162 centimeters, well short of being able to make a carousel autoloader using unitary shells. This is one of the reasons why Soviet tanks using a carousel type loader tend to split the shell up into two parts, propellant and shell, and automatically load both parts to form a single shell. That ingenious solution is certainly very clever, but when it comes to an APF SDS round, one of the factors affecting anti-armor performance is the length of the rod itself. Generally speaking, longer rods are preferable to shorter ones. If your shell is split into two pieces, it is inherently harder to get a longer APF SDS rod. Assuming this was done with a conventionally laid out tank, where the tracks and suspension project from the sides of the hull, then the only possible solution is to have very narrow tracks. This is even more acute, as even larger caliber guns with longer unitary shells are considered, and, clearly, the central width could be made larger. The tracks get substantially narrower, which is limiting on the performance. Vyashorek's solution skipped deftly around this problem. By retaining a track of the same width as the conventional or normally laid out tank, and still providing substantial internal width without exceeding the maximum 3 meters overall tank width limit, the dimensions for the Via Shorex tank were actually a maximum hull width of 3.42 meters, and with the side skirts on, a total width of 4.3. Via Shorex decided to place the APF SDS and heat shells on separate stacks, the kinetic rounds on the top. This would then allow for very simple choosing of the next shell to be loaded, making it very easy to keep track of which shell is which. Both the gunner and the commander could select which type of round would be loaded next. These would be loaded into the gun by two, quote, robotic mechanisms. This concludes part one of our videos on the Viachoric Anjou Blondie du Combat and Anjou Blondie du Combat Lore main battle tanks. If you like this video, please leave a like and a subscription. You can find more information relating to these vehicles in the full article, which is linked in the description. If you like what we are doing and want to let us continue working on these videos, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be allocated to improving our articles and videos for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.